Pleasure being here, as always. Thank you, Dr. Bansi Sabu and the entire team of Diacon for this wonderful, wonderful performance, warmth and hospitality, as always. So um, you heard just a while ago a similar session being uh, you know, presented regarding the second generation insulins. And um, we know that, you know, just as we were saying, you have Android users and you have loyal Apple users. So it depends on what you want to choose. It's on you. As long as you have the affordability, we know that the second generation insulins are better than the first generation insulins. Again, just to clarify that any basal insulin does the job of bringing down the blood sugar, the fasting to the target levels. And in doing so, it achieves the target HbA1c. However, there are differences between the first and the second generation insulins in the term of flexibility, of timing that we had been uh, talking about, about convenience, and also the safety profile, whether we are talking 24-hour hypoglycemia or especially nocturnal hypoglycemia. So with this context, this is going to be the summary of my talk, I talk about the clinical implications of glycemic variability and time in range. Again, something that you have been hearing about. And you'll keep on hearing about time in range and glycemic variability because these are the terminologies that we are talking about more often. And we are not satisfied only to have HbA1c on board. We know that there are fallacies and three different individuals walking into a clinic having very similar HbA1c's might have entirely different time in ranges. So we are now focusing on time in range and it has been advocated by many, many guidelines, especially ADA 2022 has incorporated that into their guidelines as well. And then again, one of the studies that we had been hearing about in range study and this is what we are going to talk about because this is one of the uh, studies that talks about the need for addressing the glycemic variability. So glycemic variability is a common challenge for the people with diabetes and excessive glycemic variability and suboptimal time in range can significantly impact lives of people with diabetes. And we now have international guidelines and I said ADA 2022 has incorporated regarding the time in range and you had been seeing anyone with type 1 or type 2 diabetes should at least maintain a time in range more than 70%. So suboptimal time in range can have significant negative impact on the lives of people with diabetes and we have seen that 10% drop in the time in range was associated with a significant increase in the frequency of Retinopathy, so majority of the microvascular complications like retinopathy, microalbuminuria, neuropathy, all of them go up and that results in a significant higher uh, mortality, uh, especially the cardiovascular mortality and also all-cause mortality. Now international guidelines recommend time in range and glycemic variability as key matrices and we said that recommendations of the international consensus on time in range 2019 has advocated that a metric of glycemic control that provides more actionable information than A1C alone. And ADA 2022 especially says time in range is associated with the risk of microvascular complications and can be used for assessment of glycemic control. So this is the timeline, how it was incorporated. So initially by 2012, we know that time in range was defined. And finally, by the time we get to 2022, we see that ADA says CGM as an important tool for hypoglycemia prevention. Glucose fluctuations are a process in time with two principal dimensions. We know that amplitude and time matters. And if you have a significant higher glucose levels throughout the day that results in microvascular complications. Similarly, if you have a postprandial glucose surge, what we call MAGE, then the chances of a future cardiovascular event goes up very significantly. So we have very specific targets. So the glycemic variability or coefficient of variation, the target should be less than 36%. So all peaks may look good, but they are not. When you are talking about the peaks, that come after a post-meal surge of uh, you know, glycemia, that doesn't look good at all. So it's not like Mount Everest, so you have to, uh, you have to know that. 
So this is another very important study which shows that a postprandial surge or MAGE uh, is a very important factor for a post uh, a future cardiovascular event, and the risk is as high as that of a smoker. So you see in here, anyone who is having recurrent MAGE you will be having an uh, odds ratio which was very similar to a person who is a smoker. Again, understanding time and range for type 1 and type 2 diabetic patients. Uh, we know that we have defined that both for type 1 and type 2 patients, the target time and range should be 70% at least, with less than 30% being spent in hyperglycemia or time above range, and less than 5% being spent in hypoglycemia. Similarly, if it's an elderly individual, if it's a frail individual with a very high chance of hypoglycemia risk, then you can cut a little slack, and the time in range for these individuals would be around 50%. So how does a basal insulin effectively address the hypoglycemia, glycemic variability, and time in range? So glycemic variability can affect the peaks. So caused by the glycemic excursion or the post-meal, post, post glucose surge. And basically insulin, what it does is it goes and hits the base. So we know that we have talked about fix the fasting first. And basal insulin effectively goes and fixes the base. And that's how it mitigates the spikes. Basal offers also flexibility of using postprandial target OADs, as we had been talking about, whether it's the AGIs or the repuglinides, you can use that over on top of a basal insulin. How does it address the trough? So if you have a second generation basal insulin which has a much flatter profile with very less glycemic variability, then we know that the hypoglycemia risk is going to be mitigated. So it's got much lesser risk than U100 glargin. For example, Second generation insulins like U300 will have a much lesser incidence of hypoglycemia because of its flatter profile with U100 glargin. Similarly, U100, which still remains the gold standard basal insulin, will have lesser hypoglycemia risk as compared to a NPH. So this is exactly what happens. It goes and hits the base and the entire thing shifts down. So we need to address the base first if we want to mitigate hypo or hyperglycemia. Similarly, look at this. This is NPH or a first generation basal insulin. You see, there's a lot of glycemic variability that comes. With the second generation basal insulin, so what would it do? If you bring down the fasting to the target levels, there will be significant number of hypoglycemic episodes that can occur because of the glycemic variability. With the second generation insulins, it, it has got a much flatter profile. So even when you bring down the fasting to the target levels, the chances of hypoglycemia is not as much. So it's visually very, very clear to all of you why second generation insulins, although same efficacy as that of first generation insulins, have much lesser risk of nocturnal or overall hypoglycemia. So there are various studies that have been done, whether it's the PKPD study in type 1 diabetic patients, or the various RCTs, or the real world evidences that has been done in the type 2 diabetic patients, comparing U300 glargin versus IDEG, and it depends on how you do the statistics really and which platform you're sp speaking from, uh, it, it, it really matters. But overall, we can say that, you know, it, it, it all comes down to your choice of Apple versus Androids, you know, like, so it's your choice. But one thing that I wanted to highlight about U300 glargin, of course, as we go along, it's got a smaller volume to inject. So that is quite convenient at times. So now coming to the in-range study, we had already seen this study a little while ago. I'll be interpreting that in a very different way. So time in range using insulin glargin 300 versus insulin degladec in type 1 diabetic patients, and it's a head-to-head -head randomized control in-range study. So the study design was, it was a 12-week multi-center randomized active control parallel group open-level study. And anyone who is an adult between 18 and 70 were recruited. Baseline HbA1c was between 7 and 10%. What was done? Initially, screening was done. And there was an initial run-in period. And at this point of time, there was a 20-day blinded CGM that was done. And then they were randomized to either U300 glargin or IDEG. And they were followed up for 12 weeks. 
The last 20 days, again, there was a blinded CGM, and the primary and the main secondary endpoint was measured at the end of 12 weeks. So some interesting facts. During the titration period, U300 or IDEG100 were titrated to achieve the target fasting self-measured, which was between 70 and 100, and mealtime insulin analog was titrated to achieve a two-hour postprandial uh, target of 130 to 180, while avoiding hypoglycemia. So primary endpoint, percentage time and range between 70 and 180 at the end of 12 weeks, and main secondary endpoint would have been the glycemic variability at 12 weeks. What are the other study endpoints? The descriptive statistics presented for other efficacy and safety variables, like, for example, change in A1C, percentage time above range, that is anything more than 180 milligrams per deciliter, and time below range, which was less than 70 at the end of 12 weeks. Safety endpoints would have been primarily the rates of hypoglycemia, whether it's nocturnal, or if you do it graded-wise, less than 70, between 70 and 54, or less than 54. And severe hypoglycemia requiring third-party assistance, incidence of adverse events, and change in insulin dose. The baseline characteristics were well matched between the two groups. And of course, again, baseline characteristics were very, very uh, comparable between the two groups, whether you're talking diabetic complications or the baseline characteristics. So the primary endpoints, time and range, non-inferiority was proved at the end of 12 weeks. So when we, when we are comparing U300 glargin versus IDIG100, we did see very similar time in range with these two second generation basal insulins. Main secondary endpoint, glucose and uh, variability or coefficient of variability that was the secondary endpoint that we were looking into. And main secondary endpoint was met with non-inferiority being shown in the study between U300 glargin and IDIG100. Um, and other secondary endpoints were A1C change, a very little change was there. Uh, very similar changes from the baseline, only numerical differences not resulting in significance. Hypoglycemia anytime, 24 hours, again, uh, very, very similar. And if you look at the event rate, uh, again, slightly favors uh, U U300 glargin. If you look at the numerical incidences of hypoglycemia anytime, it's slightly uh, sort of, you know, it's pretty much in the midline. There's not much of difference. Now, if you're talking about nocturnal hypoglycemia, again, very, very similar between the groups, maybe just numerical differences. And again, it's depending on how you analyze the data. If you look at the incidence, it slightly favors degladic. But if you're talking about event rate number of events, again, it uh, sort of uh, is in the unity line or slightly favoring that of U300 glargin. So the in-range study is the first RCT comparing second generation basal in uh, analogs and U300 versus U100 glargin in type 1 diabetic patients. And we were looking into time in range as the primary endpoint. So the key takeaways from this in range study was that non inferiority was proved between U300 glargin and uh, IDEG. Main secondary endpoint was met, that means non inferiority for glycemic variability. And finally, when it comes to hypoglycemia and the safety profile, it was very, very similar between the two groups. Within day variability and between day glucose variability. Uh, so, this was the objective of this study was to look into uh, within day variability and intra day variability. That means what happens in, 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 in the various days. Again, within day variability and intra day variability was very, very similar between uh, U300 glargin and uh, IDEG in type 1 diabetic patients. Strengths. Prospective, multi-center, randomized, active control, parallel group, comparative design, use of clinically relevant CGM matrices, and blinded CGM has been allowed. The uh, clinical properties of U300, Glargin, and U100, uh, IDEG100 to be compared. And the limitation was that it was an open level study design, and longer term CGM data collection would probably uh, sort of uh, be more meaningful. So to summarize, Use of continuous glucose monitoring allows a more complete assessment of the overall glycemic control and supports time in range. At present, there is no CGM literature on the use of CGM to compare between the second generation insulins.
In range, a multi-center, randomized, active control, parallel group, 12-week, open-level phase four will collect CGM data over the 20 consecutive days from adults, type one, randomized. Excuse me, can you please ask somebody to mute the music or close the door for us? I think it's in the other hall. Let it be. It's okay. So the same performance is going in the other hall, so it's okay. The study is designed to demonstrate that U300 glargin uh, is non-inferior to IDEG in terms of glycemic control and especially time in range and also matches in terms of safety profile and glycemic variability. So in-range study has achieved its primary as well as secondary endpoints in, time, uh, in terms of time in range and glycemic variability. And again, so standing here with all the experience that I have from both these molecules, I want to highlight that U100 glargin is the gold standard. We still use it. We use it to get the patients fasting down to the control levels efficiently. Second generation insulins are for those who can afford it. If they can afford, you have two choices, either apples or androids. It's your it's your choice what you feel comfortable with. I'm an Apple user and I'll always be. And the, and the pointers towards U300 would be, you know, the flexibility of the dosing. So you need not take it exactly at the end of 24 hours. Second thing is we talk about the convenience. And third, we talk about the safety profile, whether we're talking about overall a 24-hour hypoglycemia or especially nocturnal hypoglycemia, which seems to be much lesser as compared to the first generation insulins. Uh, and of course, as I wanted to highlight, that U300 glargin comes in one third the volume, the same units, so you need to push less. And sometimes that is very helpful when the doses are higher. Um, sometimes limitation of these basal insulins is that you can't give more than 40 units or 50 units in one shot. In, in U300 glargin, you can give up to 70 units. So that remains a definite uh, sort of you know, advantage with this particular molecule. So with this, thank you so much.